oil. It's saturated throughout Southern California. You already know this. I just did a seven minute segment on this. I swear I'm not backtracking. Just hang on for like 15 seconds of exposition here. We got tons of oil, but so do other places like Texas, New Mexico, Alaska, North Dakota. But Southern California has something caused by that oil that none of those other states have. Tar pits. And right now you're probably thinking, cool, I guess. Well, I didn't know this. Southern California has a monopoly on tar pits like in the entire world. There's a total of 14 tar pits and we got four of them. Second place goes to the country of Venezuela, which nice dry, my dudes. Better luck next geological period. So to find out why we got the corner on this, I drove like a mile to visit the world's only urban tar pits. 20 million years ago, this would have been underwater, under the ocean, where you had a lot of growth of marine algae. And so that algae sinked to the ocean floor. Those were being deposited over the last like 20 million years. And then because of you have the sediment stacking up, which causes pressure and heat, these algae kind of cook and then become oil. Southern California, like we have the monopoly on asphalt lakes. Yeah. Why, why is that? So does that have anything to do with us like being on a fault lane or anything like that? Why we, it got risen up or? That's exactly why the oh, okay. asphalt comes to the surface here. Cool, I didn't research that. I just made yeah. a wild guess. <laughs> Very it good, sounds... Very intuitive. There's a fault that runs through called the Sixth Street Fault. Uh, and so it kind of runs- It's called the Sixth Street Sixth Fault? Sixth Street Fault and it runs this way. And there's also a third street fault, which also runs this way. Jesus, well, it looks like my new root home is 4th Street. <laughs> this is what we call pit 61. Asphalt comes up, spreads out on the surface, and on a warm day, it uh -huh. flows out. You know, they can make these big aprons like 30 feet across, but then it gets covered, so you can't really see it. It's got dirt and leaves on top of it. And if you were an unsuspecting animal, you could just walk right on top of that. Yeah. You know, and it, there's, even if there's that much asphalt, you're done for. And Sometimes, um, unfortunately, we still have animals that get entrapped. So we'll have an occasional squirrel or birds that can um, think this uh -huh. is a nice place to have a little drink. They can get mired. So it does still happen and uh, it's a natural process. Do, when you say it's a natural process, does that mean you let it just happen or do you guys save the animals? If it's, if it can be saved, oh, no. we would make an attempt to save it. But yeah. usually by the time that we get there, it's too late or the animal is already dead. E. Yeah. And then we just sort of push them down. To let them become right. what they fell into. But if you think about it, everything dies eventually. Yes. And you're, you're, you're kind of lucky if you're preserved <laughs> as a fossil because then you're, you know, forever memorialized. <laughs> That's what I'm gonna put in my will. Dump me in the tar pits. Yeah, exactly. Oh, she's like actively working. Yeah. So our excavators are out here 361 days a year. Wow. We're the world's only active urban paleontological site. Wow. It's just like a big mess of murder. <laughs> that is crazy. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, I always just assume like an animal would be solidly found in something. The carcasses actually decompose pretty quickly and then there's no soft tissue left. And so those bones then all separate. This pile that we're staring at, like how many different animals and organisms do you think that is? It could be a ton. Um, this would be say like 5,000 years of animals that passed through this area and got stuck. So you can think of it Jeez. like fly paper. If you had some fly paper up for 5,000 years, how many, how many flies and bugs and different kinds of animals would you find? How do you sort this out? <laughs> right, um, very slowly with much patience and carefully. So all these bones are just jumbled up. These are all those isolated bones that just get jammed into these asphalt chimneys. These are ribs, these kind of long bones that stick out. Um, we think this might be a sloth skull. So Whoa. a giant brown sloth skull. Where should we put it? What yeah. is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, this is Laura is... Tewksbury, everybody. <laughs> Laura Tewksbury Wall. She's one of our excavators. So this is what you've done today? Yeah. What are you resting on your shoulder? And so this one is that upper front leg of what? a ground sloth. 
So just those statues off in the distance there. So you'll find one of these and it won't be near any other giant bones like that. You'll just find it as almost like a one-off. Oh, this was tangled up with all those other fossils, which yeah. is why some of these, you know, we'll see one portion of it and say, oh, okay, we know what that is. That's nice. We won't be getting this out for a couple of months still. Wow. Because you have to finish going through the rest of that tangle of fossils. But even this still has other smaller fossils still stuck to it, but that's okay. The laboratory will tidy that up inside. So it's years and years to put an entire animal together. You just never get an entire animal together because of how spread out everything seems. It's actually usually more that we have so many fossils that it's hard to tell if we have only one of something, unless it's something that's very rare, uh -huh. something that has an injury or disease that shows up onto the bones, wow. or something that's very young. So like out of this deposit, we're pretty sure that if we have only one baby mastodon, because mastodons are pretty rare, and it's a baby and all the bones are of the same, we don't have any repeat bones. But if I find a direwolf adult bone next to another adult direwolf bone, very rarely can I say with any kind of confidence if they're from the same individual or could have died hundreds of years apart from each other and just ended up next to each other. Direwolf, the dumbest animal of the past? Yes, they are a more common <laughs> large animal. Okay. So before we head out, I wanted to ask two movie-related unrefined petrol questions. If I took a stick and like wrapped tar in it, could I use that as like a torch? It depends on how gas is left. Um, it would be pretty hard to ignite. If I wanted to look really cool and I was smoking a cigarette and then like flick that in there, would this just... Not here because it's in open air. Okay. And so the, the gas is quickly diluted. <sighs> That's a bummer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, we're done here. If you live in LA, this is a site that probably hasn't crossed your mind maybe in decades. It's just one of those in the background places like Hollywood and Highland or the Hollywood Walk of Fame. But this place is kind of actually awesome and it's pretty cool we have this. There's no other major city with this. And personally for me, being this close to past giants, it brings out that same deeply buried child in me that thought it was sick as hell to wear glow in the dark dinosaur t-shirts. Personally, I'd recommend getting your own film crew so you can go behind the scenes close up and touch a 40,000 year old giant sloth thigh. Otherwise, the museum is definitely worth a visit.